Kansas is widely thought of as endless croplands to many Americans, but it's actually a land of rugged beauty and diversity. This area, made up of approximately 82,000 square miles, is divided into 11 distinct physiographic regions. Each region tells a unique story about Kansas's geological past. In this film, we'll explore the rugged terrain in central and western Kansas. Specifically, we'll take an in-depth look at two main physiographic regions. The first region is the Smoky Hills, which follows the Smoky Hills River as it carves its way through the central prairies of Kansas. The second region is known as the Gypsum Hills, and is located in South Kansas along the Oklahoma border. We'll also be learning about the unique flora and fauna that make up these regions. Bison, which once roamed Kansas numbering in the millions, currently exist in small herds on preserves and private pastures across both the Gypsum and the Smoky Hills. The region known as the Smoky Hills occupies the north-central part of Kansas. It is delineated by outcrops of Cretaceous Age rock and takes its name from the early morning haze that often gathers there in the valleys. There are three main belts that make up this region. The Smoky Hills proper comprise the easternmost belt, with the two western belts often referred to as the Blue Hills. The Dakota Formation forms the eastern region of the Smoky Hills. This area is characterized by outcroppings of sandstone. The other band that we're focusing on in this film is the western band of the Smoky Hills, and is represented by chalk beds of the Niobrara Formation. The Dakota Sandstone region of the Smoky Hills is the remains of beach sands and sediments dumped by rivers into the early Cretaceous seas. The hills and buttes in this part of the Smoky Hills, such as Coronado Heights and Twin Mound, are capped by this sandstone and rise sharply from the surrounding plains. Coronado Heights and Twin Mounds were some of the first major landmarks as travelers made their way into the Smoky Hills. One story accounts a pioneer's escape, as a homesteader used a rock overhang on the north summit of Twin Mound as cover to evade a band of pursuing natives. Today, Twin Mound is a short distance from Maxwell Wildlife Preserve in McPherson County. The hills, canyons, and prairie in the preserve provide a perfect habitat for bison and elk to roam very similar to how they existed a hundred years ago. The numbers are not known for exact. There may have been as many as 60 to 80 million of them in North America, along with an, probably an equal number of pronghorns and elk and deer and um, grizzly bear and black bear and mountain lions. I mean, we used to have a a uh, really amazing uh, megafauna assemblage on the Great Plains. But the, the bison and the uh, pronghorns and the prairie dogs in particular were the three that probably sculpted uh, the Great Plains uh, habitats as, as much as any other animal that lived here. Maxwell's a fun place to visit because they will uh, do tours where they take people out uh, in uh, special vehicles and then they uh, they lay down some range cubes and the bison like those about as well as cattle do so they'll come up where you can practically reach right out and touch them it's it's <laughs> it's real impressive one of the best times of year to do that is um, mid late may after they've dropped their calves because baby bison are about as cute as baby anything and so having them scampering around in addition to the adults is it makes it for a lot of fun West of the refuge is Coronado Heights. Coronado Heights is a part of the Smoky Hills Buttes and is adorned with a castle made from indigenous rock. This twin buttes and, and Coronado Heights is really all sort of part of a, sort of the eastern edge of the Smoky Hills. Really that whole area would have been flat sand covered area, but over time in the intervening hundred million years, as that area is exposed to erosion, Erosion removes the sandstone from in between those hills, so you get outliers of hills that are capped by the Dakota sandstone. Coronado Heights is probably the best one known, but there's even one further east, there's one called Iron Mound, east of Salina, that really is sort of a, uh, a marker saying now you're entering the Smoky Hills. Another great place to find outcroppings of Dakota sandstone is Kannapolis State Park. This park is just a short distance west of Coronado Heights and boasts rocky cliffs, canyons, rock shelters, and hoodoos. The best place to see these formations is in Horse Thief Canyon and Red Rock Canyon in the northeast section of the park. Geologically, a lot of stuff going on there. In addition to being on the Smoky Hill River and sort of carved in the, the hills there, uh, there are various kinds of uh, minerals or rocks that you can collect there. So Horse Thief Canyon is just one of the canyons and there are numbers of them up there. 
what's nice about Horse Thief is you can hike through there. And so it's got a great hiking trail. You can see all that Dakota Formation sandstone. Moving on from the Dakota Sandstone region, our next destination on our Smoky Hills journey lands us in the Niobrara Chalk Formations. The Chalk Badlands here also contain a rich fossil record of animals that lived in the vast inland sea that covered western Kansas during the Cretaceous period. The Fick Fossil Museum, north of the ranch in Oakley, is an excellent place to see some of the fossils discovered in the area. In the Smoky Hill Chalk, uh, it's a shallow, warm water sea, somewhat like the Caribbean. The top predators are the big mosasaurs, big swimming lizard. They're fairly closely related to the modern Komodo dragon, the biggest lizards alive today. Uh, but they have paddles rather than, than feet and they lived their entire life in the ocean. In Kansas, they grew to 35 to 40 feet long, but our rocks in Kansas end before the end of the Cretaceous. So in the last part of the Cretaceous, they got as long as about 50 feet, 50 or 55 feet. So they were truly immense, huge animals, huge predators. Got giant fish, uh, Zephactinus, uh, grew to lengths of 20 feet and, uh, and it had huge teeth. So, you know, I, I compare it to a, uh, a tarpon on steroids because it was a long, very long, thin, silvery fish that was the terror of the ocean at that point. And there were lots of them. We find a whole lot more than I want to dig up. Um, but then you've got a whole range of smaller fish below that. And then you've got a bunch of sharks. Uh, we have a shark here called the um, Cretoxa rhinomantelli, which is the Ginsu shark that is as big as a modern great white, it has shark teeth that big. And then we've got the little sharks that have serrated teeth and you can see the, the serrated marks on, on rib bones in particular where they cut the meat off the bone as they, you hope the animal was dead when it happened because it, uh, it looked painful. It's a very diverse environment. Um, it's been collected literally since the, 18, the late 1860s and we're still finding and naming new species, which I think is pretty fantastic. Uh, but it, it's what you'd expect for a very diverse ocean. And the fact that being preserved as a fossil is like um, winning the lottery. And then being found and dug up and described as winning the lottery again, because most fossils simply wash out and are destroyed. The last leg of our journey lands us in the Gypsum Hills in South Central Kansas. Gyp Hills are a very different environment. They're much older than mostly what we've been talking about. These are rocks that are deposited during the Permian period of geologic history, a couple hundred million years ago. During that time period, that area that's covered by the Jip Hills is sort of an embayment that water could flow into. And at times that water, the source of that water got cut off, that water would evaporate and it would leave behind rock units that geologists call, for obvious reasons, evaporite. So things like, probably the best known one is salt. But gypsum and other kinds of rocks get deposited at the bottom of that, that old embayment and they underlie a lot of Kansas. Now, in some places they're in the subsurface, that salt is mined in Hutchinson and Lyons and Canopolis, but where you see those rocks exposed to the, at the surface is the Red Hills in that area down around, particularly Medicine Lodge and on to the west. There the Jip Hills cap those hills, again it's gypsum that's, that uh, when it was deposited those are flat lying rocks, differential erosion then removed rock in between the hills, so it sculpted these hills. What's really making them striking is partly the way they, the, the formations look, but also their color. Uh, that, in addition to being known as the, the Jip Hills, it's also known as the Red Hills because very many of those rocks that are deposited, not so much the gypsums, but the siltstones and the sandstones, 
are stained red by iron oxide. So if you drive throughout those hills, they're, they're, they have a deep red, very striking color. So you get this combination of butte and mesa topography from the, the gypsum that, that is capped in the tops of those hills, and then the stained iron oxide color just forms a very dramatic landscape. Look, really, in many respects, looks more like Arizona and New Mexico than it does uh, Kansas. Clark County is, is kind of spectacular, partly because there's deep erosional features there, and uh, so a steep-sided canyon, especially if you come into Clark County State Lake from the west, it's like you don't even know this exists, and all of a sudden the country just drops off and forms this canyon. The other thing that's really spectacular in a geologic sense about Clark County State Lake is how many different units you can see in place in a, a small amount of area there. Some hills that are capped by uh, Ogallala Formation not very far away, along with all these Permian rocks that, that are, are there. And, and, I, and I have to go back and check, but I think there are even some Cretaceous things that crop out there as well. So really within the spa uh, space of a, almost sometimes a few hundred yards, you can see 200 million years worth of geologic history. Kansas, you know, is, has this reputation as being fairly flat and featureless and not very, you know, interesting geologically. And certainly, there are parts of the High Plains in, in the rest of the state where I'd say, yeah, I can, I can understand that reputation. What I would say to people is, get off the big highways, get off of I-70, get off the turnpike, open your eyes, take a little bit of time, and see what's out there. The prairie is kind of an acquired taste. Um, we don't have huge mountains, we don't have ocean beaches and whatnot, but the, uh, the prairie is uh, appreciated in its, uh, uh, in its details, in its fine details. And uh, sometimes you have to actually get down at that level in order to appreciate it fully, appreciate all the uh, variety of uh, pollinating insects and other insects that live there, the variety uh, of, of flowering plants, over 800 uh, flowering plant species in Kansas alone. Um, and most of those are, are prairie species, either tall grass or short grass uh, prairie species. Uh, each one has um, figured out how to live here. Uh, each one has um, learned through trial and error and uh, over the millennia what it takes to survive in this place, and each one has a, a valuable lessons to teach us about how we can survive here too.